What's good, everybody? It's your boy Malik Wilson, co-host of 3NT Podcast and the SmackDown Recap Team on Dirt Sheet Radio. John and Nick are currently covering ROH, leaving me here to do this alone. John, I better get a pizza party for this. I know you can hear me. But anyway, let's go ahead and get into it. I ain't got much time. I'm trying to play PlayStation today. The show opens with Nick Aldis in the bloodline. All this is telling Solo Sokoa and the Bloodline they will need to forfeit their spot in the number one contenders tag team gauntlet match due to an apparent eye injury Tongaloa suffered during their beatdown on Cody Rhodes and Kevin Owens last week. Tama Tonga takes issue with this and instead of barking, he actually speaks and says the Bloodline isn't forfeiting anything. Solo Sokoa speaks up and says while Tongaloa is part of the Bloodline, so is Jacob Fatu, and they aren't forfeiting anything, and the bloodline will be represented by Tama Tonga and Jacob Fatu, if that's okay with him. Nick Aldis agrees and says he's fine with it and allows Jacob to take Tongaloa's place in the match. Solo then tells Jacob to bring the titles home because he wants the titles in the bloodline. Hey, Siri. Uh-huh? Play 50 Cent, somebody gonna die tonight. We then cut to LA Knight walking out to the ring from backstage, trash talking Santos Escobar, saying he's going to teach him a lesson because he seemed to have forgotten that LA Knight has beaten him before in classes in session. Santos and Knight go on to have a pretty good match with Santos even hitting a 619. You know, for all the deadbeats out there. But in typical heel fashion, Logan Paul shows up trying to cost Knight the match. It doesn't work as Knight hits Santos with a BFT for the win, but doesn't get a chance to celebrate as Logan Paul attacks him again while he isn't looking. Logan and Santos shake hands, aligning themselves in their hate for the yeah movement, and subsequently put Tim's on LA Knight before Logan hits his signature frog splash to end the segment. Backstage, Byron Saxton is catching up with Naomi about why Blair Davenport showed her respect at first, then attacks her. Naomi says she has no idea why that newbie has an issue with her, but she's gonna make her not only feel the glow, but respect it. Jay Cargill and Bianca Belair walk up, acknowledging Naomi and say they have business they need to take care of as well with calling out the women's tag team champs, Isla Dawn and Alba Fire. After the break, we cut back to Byron being nosy again backstage as he catches up with Logan Paul, asking him about his attack on LA Knight. Logan says it's just an appetizer for what's to come for LA Knight and what he has in store for him at SummerSlam and that he's gonna whoop him. Logan says SummerSlam is in his hometown of Cleveland and he just got off the phone with Mr. Cleveland himself and there will be a homecoming surprise for him next week. He then tells Knight that at SummerSlam, he's not just wrestling the United States champion, but he's also wrestling a social media megastar, the pride of Cleveland, the ultimate underdog turned top dog Logan Paul and that he's not ready. <laughs> you know, that is a pretty good promo for Logan Paul, I can't front. While I don't agree with them holding the US title hostage that could be used to build up mid-card talent, he is using it and showing signs of growth every time he's on TV and given the opportunity. Salute to Logan, man. After that, Bianca and Jade make their way to the ring to call out the women's tag team champs, Fire and Dawn, saying that ever since they've won the titles, they've been ducking the fade and said the tag team champs said they will be on SmackDown, so where they at though? The champ's music hits before Jay can really say anything. WWE, fix her, please. But show up and attack the former tag team champs from behind. Jay and Bianca fend them off, leaving the tag team champ scurrying in retreat. WWE then shows highlights of them doing shows in Japan the day before and earlier in the day, showing Cody Rhodes being the good old champ that he is, which also means psst, Cody ain't here tonight but there will be a tape exclusive interview with him later on in the night. After that, the Street Profits are backstage with B-Fab, seemingly back to their old selves after news circulating about Bobby Lashley not renewing his contract with the company. Boxing champ Terrence Crawford walks up to them where they show mutual respect. Crawford says he's rooting for the Profits and for them to do their thing because he'll be watching. 
After the break, we have a match blow highlight of last week where BBL Bailey beats the hell out of Tiffany Stratton's Money in the Bank briefcase and helping Meechin pick up a victory over her. Before we see Tiffany backstage with the briefcase held together by duct tape, Nia Jax walks up to her, telling her not to worry about the briefcase and she'll get her a new one that's perfect for her. She then warns her to not cash it in on Bailey because of her match with her at SummerSlam and that she will hate for Tiffy to have such a short title reign. This is a real interesting dynamic if I could say so myself. Tiffany says there's no need to worry about that because all she wants tonight is revenge on Bailey. A tag match is then announced between Bailey and Michin versus Nia and Tiffy for our main event. After that, it's tag team gauntlet match time for the number one contendership. It starts out with Baron Corbin and Apollo Crews. Uh, why are these two a tag team together? And Humberto and Garza of Legado del Fantasma kicking things off with the tag team champs DIY watching closely backstage. Corbin hits the end of days to eliminate Legado del Fantasma first. Next comes in a fresh Street Profits where Ford drops Apollo on his head and almost breaks his freaking neck. The two teams have a great showing though with Apollo showing he can still wrestle and deserves more TV time along with Baron Corbin showing athletic high-flying ability we didn't know that he had. But it's not enough as the Street Profits eliminate Corbin and Apollo. In comes in pretty deadly next and the two teams don't have nearly the chemistry as the previous match but it sees the Profits prevailing over the fresh pretty deadly to eliminate them and advance to the OC. The Prophets then eliminate the OC because why shouldn't they? The OC have been demoted to NXT at this point. Then out comes the main attraction of this match, the Bloodline. The Prophets have gone through three teams at this point and are tired as fuck and are getting picked apart by Jacob and Tama while Chance of Solo sucks arise and Jacob yelling to the crowd at the top of his lungs to respect the Tribal Chief and actually screaming, I love you, Solo. The I universe who are not pleased with the bloodline tonight. Solo, Solo Sakura, I love you. Like <laughs> yo, this is yo. I got a I can't front, man. Jacob has been amazing. The prophet try to fight back with heroic athleticism for Ford, with even a springboard DDT on Jacob, but. Jacob no sells it, hits him with a super kick, followed by throwing Ford at least 12 feet in the air for a Samoan drop, then hitting one of the best, most athletic moonsaults you will ever see to secure the number one contendership for DIY's tag team championships. Next, we have Corey Graves and Wade Barrett discussing the events that just transpired with the Bloodline when they are interrupted by A-Town Down Under, calling out Terrence Crawford saying that he needs to apologize for sticking his nose in the business it didn't belong last week in their match against Cody Rhodes and Kevin Owens. I got a feeling somebody gonna get knocked out here. Out comes Crawford to his own entrance music, which was pretty dope by the way. Waller, of course, does all the talking, telling Crawford if he takes one more step towards him, Theory's gonna knock him out. Puzzled, Theory says he's not trying to fight Crawford, only to get knocked out by Crawford, and once again, Waller leaves Theory in the ring alone, sleep. Next, we have the quote-unquote interview with undisputed WWE champion Cody Rhodes. He's by himself, guys. There's nobody interviewing him. This isn't an interview. Cody reflects on his road to finishing the story, saying once he won the title, he thought the bloodline would be over, but now he's facing a doppelganger version of the bloodline. Cody says that they've taken out all his friends trying to fight by his side, but he owes it to the people to keep fighting and not let the title fall back into the hands of the bloodline. Cody says before, he didn't think Solo was ready, but now he's not so sure and that next week he wants to look solo in the eyes and see the type of man he is but he wants to do it one-on-one -on -one. and he challenges him to meet him in the ring to do so next week cody says he wants to see if he's ready for the challenge because cody certainly is after the commercial break we cut to backstage with byron being annoying again interviewing andrade Saxton asks Andrade what's next for him after his victory last week over Carmelo Hayes. Hayes shows up and says things aren't finished with him and Andrade. Andrade says no things are because Melo actually missed. 
Melo responds that the crowd didn't miss Andrade for the last two years after he left. Andrade tells Melo that Melo isn't LeBron, but more like Bronny Jr. Melo says that Andrade needs to step aside because it's his time now. And Andrade agrees to have another match with him next week. We finally get to our main event of Bailey and Meechin versus Nia Jax and Tiffany Stratton, with Meechin walking out to the ring first, only to get attacked by Stratton and Jax during her walkout. Bailey runs to the ring with a kendo stick to save Meechin, but appears the damage has been done with Meechin clenching her elbow, laying outside the ring. Meechin does try to make her way back up to the apron for the tag after Bailey hold things down, only to be attacked again from Naya from behind, delivering a massive Samoan drop to Meechin to the ringside floor. For most of the match, Tiffany and Nia work over the champ in a true heel fashion until Meechin finally gets herself together and gets on the apron for the hot tag. Unfortunately, the one minute she gave her of support wasn't enough as Tiffany decks Bentley with the briefcase while the ref is distracting and Nia hits the Annihilator for the pin. But wait, there's more. Before the show closes out, the Bloodline show up in their mysterious smoky boardroom where Solo says he will indeed meet Cody in the ring next week for their face-off. Solo says next week the Tongans will capture the Tag Team Championships and he will go on the next night to become the WWE Champion. And if Roman Reigns has a problem with that, he know where to find him and he will end up exactly like Randy Orton, Kevin Owens, and Cody Rhodes. And he will acknowledge him in my opinion this was a pretty bad episode of smackdown if i could say so myself it was pretty hard to get through with the hot spot being of course jacob fatu so in my opinion i think the tag team match should have been the main event if i had to rate it i give it a one out of five this has been malik wilson with dirt sheet radio i'm out hot boy, hot boy.